Okay, as you get older and older, okay, that's what happens. Significant increases. It's about a third of the American population now has abstract sleep apnea, one third of the American population. So you can imagine the ratio of how much it is. About 12% of them are severe sleep apnea, 12% of them are waking up every few minutes. So this is as prevalent as maybe diabetics. You know, diabetics is the most common one of all of them. So it's getting there. Okay, so that's the problem with this one here. And you know, but in, in well, well, what dictates these factors? Okay, what dictates this? Well, multiple issues. You know, we have obviously the maxillofacial skeleton. That means everything from the nose to the maxilla to the mandible. Those are the skeletal things. And these skeletal things anchor the soft tissue to them, right? So the soft tissue is, is what collapses in these patients, okay? Okay, so that's what happens. So there's a lot of factors which dictate on these aspects of it. So the obstruction can happen in the nose. Okay, this is called the nasopharynx. It can happen in the mouth or the oropharynx where the tongue can fall back or the soft palate can collapse down. All these things can happen. So remember the air passing from here. Any obstruction anywhere from the nose to the surge turbinates, to the soft palate, to the hard palate position if they're very deficient, to the mandible, the tongue itself, to the hyoid bone where it's positioned. All those factors dictate it, okay? So that's what happens in this patient. So the obstruction can happen anywhere else. However, the most common obstruction is more in the hypopharyngeal area, that means just below the tongue base. That's what happens most often. So here's what is an interesting thing for you to know that. So if you rest it, if you see how much of oxygen, you need, how much of effort you need to breathe in, okay? For a person who is normal and awake, this is how much we do, one to two centimeters of water per liter. That is the amount of force you need for the air. The airway resistance is what you're developing. But here's what happens. When you sleep, that increases about five times or so, okay? And so what happens? All of a sudden, one to two centimeters is about five or 10 centimeters, which is okay for a lot of us. We can still rest us through that and breathe in our respiratory effort. But when you have increasing weight, right? Your effort, that means you have to breathe up a lot more. So imagine if you're more obese, morbidly obese, the weight on the chest is not gonna help you take a big deep breath itself. Did you know that? That's what it does. So that, so that means we are, this is a risk for weight itself, and then at the same time, you're putting all this extra effort. So that's what happens. So heavy snorers is about 50 times. That means this is almost about 50 times more than when you're awake. You need to put in extra effort to take the breath. You have 50 times extra. That's what you're doing, guys. So that's the important thing. So what happens here? This is the reason why we need to do this, okay? So let me tell you exactly how this cycle happens, the sleep apnea with the light. You have to understand the fundamentals of this. So you go to light state of sleep, where things are still a little bit active, okay? You're, not, you're still breathing all right, okay? Then all of a sudden you get to the next stage is a deep sleep, right? Where everything relaxes. Your neck muscles relax, your tongue muscles relax, your roof of the mouth relaxes, everything relaxes, okay? So that means all of a sudden these neck muscles kind of collapse in a little bit, the soft palate falls down and your tongue sits back a little bit. Okay, that's what. So now all of a sudden, when those things happen, you get obstruction. For normally, if you don't have sleep apnea, you don't get the obstruction. Remember, we're putting more effort to breathe in, but we're not getting obstruction, okay? That's the important thing. More effort five times, which is not at all a big deal for our body to adapt to. But in deep sleep, that's what is happening. But then for, for somebody with sleep apnea, Immediately, they, they, everything collapsed in. They can't breathe anymore. So the, you get, then the oxygen level drops down. Sometimes it can drop up to 60. Have you done sedations at all? Have you seen sedations? That's bad, okay? Uh, 60 is something we start panicking and we start trying to rush through certain things, okay? So, and they live in that area there when they're sleeping. The brain, so all of a sudden, then, you, then the brain signals and says that, oh, your body is not gonna sustain these low levels of oxygen. Okay, you gotta wake up. So it gets you back to the light stage of sleep. That's what happens. So that means you get to deep stage, just to relax, you get an obstruction, you get to the light stage again. Okay, that means you're always, it keeps you between light and deep. You never get through the cycle. So that means every 15 minutes, probably you're, stay, you're cycling. That's what is happening in these things. So this is important here. When you, your body needs to rest. When you sleep, your body absolutely needs to rest. That is this fundamental thing. Because that's what minimizes, that means sympathetic nerve. That means your cardiovascular system has to rest. That's what happens, your catecholamine release has to, has to be the lowest level at this time. Okay, everything, you should, your heart should not be working that hard. 
It's like a, a pump you put up here, I think you're a break. And that's what it's important for that. So it's important to have at least a five to six hours of break in the night, preferably five to six hours minimum. So this is what happens. The blood pressure and heart rate decreases five to 10 percent, but but about stage three and stage four of sleep, it's 10 to 15 percent. So one and two stages are light stages, three and four are deep stages of sleep, and then the REM sleep. So that's the cycle you go through. So one, two, three, four, and then REM, and then you cycle back. That's the typical cycle for sleep that happens. So if you don't have that, that means you have a, about five-fold higher times of heart attack, five-fold higher times, and about ten-fold higher times of having a stroke, just from this. Besides looking like, feeling like crap in the morning, besides feeling like you're not able to uh, tire all the time, besides feeling other issues of, uh, of, uh, of uh, neurocognitive things, that means you have memory loss, you won't be able to retain information, diabetics and stuff, okay, that's the thing. So it affects every aspect of it. It affects diabetes, it affects heart problem, heart health, it affects cerebrovascular health, that is the brain health. It affects your, it causes depression, causes uh, neuropsychological implications, that means you're constantly tired if it's severe enough. So these are some of the things which I already mentioned about here, okay? So the diagnosis, how do we know this? This is the things that happens, okay? The diagnosis is based on history, that means we ask them certain questions, and I'll tell you there's a one great screening test, physical exam, polysomnography. Polysomnography is a sleep study, okay? This is how most of it's a gold standard, you do it, and I'll show you a little bit. And the home polysomnography, to cut down this, some people are doing this nowadays. So here's what it does. If you want to get a screening measure, this is the standard test, this is a screening tool, okay, screening tool. It doesn't tell you they have sleep apnea, but it gives you a suspicion if they have sleep apnea or not, then you can recommend them. Very simple question, in sitting and breathing, how often do you fall asleep? High chance of re-dosing, well, you know what? I know in dental school, this is what happens all the time, but uh, that's not what we're counting for, okay? We're counting under normal circumstances, watching TV, how often? All of us fall asleep at some point for these activities, but if you're doing it all the time, and it's very simple, you walk around on the, on the outside and where the patients are waiting, you see somebody is a little bit towards the heavier side, and they just can't say, like, they're sleeping like this, they probably may have sleep apnea, okay? Probably may have sleep apnea. So, so that's how it does. So based on this, you can come up with a score, and you will see that if you have anybody night and up, you suggest maybe you should go and see a sleep physician. That's what you would do that, okay? So you give yourself a score of one each, and then anything more than that based on this score, then that means you're uh, basically uh, have sleep apnea. So, Polysomnography, and I will show you this is, uh, you probably are gonna hear a little bit about this next time also. Uh, it's, a, it's a sleep study, which is the most important thing, and then it, what it does, it classifies how many times you stop, completely stop breathing, how many times you partially stop breathing. So it takes these things, combines it in a given hour. The other things also, is it's called respiratory disturbance, and it's basically a combination of these two, or how many times your oxygen level drops down. And this is what it involves. All these monitors, you go for a two night study, you go for a night study, half the night you put these things, and then they check for a high, every single thing, your, your, how much your force is required for the air to go in, the resistance, the muscle activities, your eye pupil movements, your brain activities, your breathing, even some breathing and how often, and, and the state of sleep you are in, and then you get that stuff. So that's the thing about diagnosis. So if you don't have, remember, I want you to remember this question. If you do not, the diagnosis of sleep apnea is polysomnography, okay, not clinical suspicion, polysomnography. Unless you have a sleep study, you can only say that it is suspicion for sleep apnea, but not sleep apnea. That's only by a sleep study. So the examination can involve a lot of factors. We're gonna talk about, I'm gonna to skip to some of this, tongue, palate, uvula, tonsils. As I said, from the nose all the way down to the level of the trachea here, okay? You gotta examine all those elements to find out where the obstruction happens. So findings in children, this is another important thing in children. Um, you guys have kids around, any of you guys have kids? Maybe you guys are too young for this thing. Some of you guys are a little old, I guess. Are too early to marry, is that the deal, guys? Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, children with sleep apnea is a big, big issue, okay? We used to, um, uh, we never really paid attention towards that. It, it's known to that that if they have a slight element of sleep apnea, slight element, okay, can cause uh, behavioral disturbances, uh, attention deficit disorders, 
Uh, they can failure to grow properly, failure to thrive. That means they just don't eat properly. They're not hungry. They're irritable. All those factors can, and also some mental delay also. So all these factors have been play, shown. So in children, we treat very, very, very aggressively. In children, very aggressively. And I'm not talking in syndrome in patients where they can't breathe. Those are emergent procedures. I think that's very different. But in general, this is treated very, very aggressively. So uh, it's a it's a completely different ballgame in children. As I said, it's. it's the surgery is the first chance for them, almost always, okay? It's, I mean, we do some positional changes. If they're not doing well in children, automatically we skip the surgery. That's what happens. Just doing a trach. You guys know what a trach is, right? You basically, basically make an opening right into the tracheos, and you put in this tube. It's all in, 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 in neonates, that is below one year of age, has a, a, a mor morbidity and mortality of 40%. So you, you can skip that. That's a goal in children. So it's, a, it's a, something to know about. So the studies we do is we basically scope the patient in the nose. If you guys like to enjoy this, I mean, you can come to our office and we can do this, but just for the heck of it. Uh, basically, we numb up the nose, we spray some stuff inside the nose, and then we put in this little scope, and you look all the way back of the nose, roof of the mouth, uh, soft palate, and then just go below that, look at the tongue base, and then we even go all the way to the trachea. And, and, uh, and basically we're looking for certain things. We're looking for what's called a Miller's Maneuver. We tell them to hold it like this and breathe against it. This, whole, this opening should completely close the sensation of the sleep apnea. It's called positive Miller's Maneuver. If I do it for all of you, unlikely that's gonna close. You're always gonna have some opening no matter what, okay? So it tells us that in patients when they fall asleep and things are relaxed, and there's a resistance increase for breathing, it collapses into sleep apnea patients, but not for others, okay? The lateral cephalogram, this is where uh, the, I think the dentistry and orthodontics really come into play. This came from, or, from orthodontics and oral surgery, actually, and that's when it became a big deal. Now it's, it's used as one of the best factors to determine airway obstruction. CT scan and MRI, mostly in children. Okay, most in children we do that. CT MRI, where it's a live MRI, again in children to see if they have obstruction and stuff. So here's what it looks like, guys. You know, we put in a scope there, and look and see, this is called complete collapse of the airway here, okay? So this is the epiglottis, this is the soft palate, it's, it's the lateral body of the, uh, the lateral pharyngeal walls, how they're completely collapsed. This is positive Miller's maneuver. No collapse is zero, uh, is a, a zero, you give a score, and if it's a complete obstruction, it's four plus, that's what it is. So that's one test, it tells you what it's doing. And this is a cephalometric analysis here. This is a normal one, and this is one with the sleep apnea, okay? Do you see the airway here, guys, right here? That is the airway. And you see the airway here? Uh, you can probably see right there, very little there. It's almost pretty much obstructed there, okay? So that's the thing there. So that's how you're doing that. In addition, we also look to see where the hyoid bone stands, okay? If the hyoid bone is lower, much, uh, if it's much closer to the mandrel, it's better. If it's away from the mandrel, it's not that great because any procedures you do to the tongue won't solve that problem much. And then this also gives you skeletally how we are. So it gives you the ratio. So that's what it does for us. Okay, those are the metrics we do. It gives us the position of the maxilla, position of the mandrel, position of the teeth, the soft palate here. This is a soft palate marking. And then you're looking at the higher and then the airway space. So the treatment of this, okay? The treatment of it is based on, is tailored to the patient's needs, okay? Right now, everybody who gets diagnosed with sleep apnea, there's only one thing we are told is that you should get a CPAP, okay? What it is basically this device which puts on top of the nose or on top of the mouth and it blows air, that's all it does. It blows the air actively keeping things open, okay? So imagine, I always tell people, if the setting goes up higher, it's like sticking your nose just on the freeway, decrease the window a little bit, stick your nose out and do walk around. How would you feel? That's the same feeling you would get with the CPAP, okay? But uh, So the question is, who's gonna wear it? right? And that's the problem with CPAP. Yes, it's a gold standard treatment. Yes, the, the treatment of choice is this. However, all, less than a third of them use it. In fact, nobody uses it 100% of the time, or very, very, maybe 10% uses it 100 So that question, it's like the blood pressure medicine is fantastic. However, you can take it only every, once every three days. That It doesn't work for that way. You know, you gotta take it consistently. So not, or whenever you take it, it's not gonna be helpful. And that's the problem. The other one is cut down all these things, just make a damn hole there. That's what we used to do that once upon a time. We don't do that anymore. So uh, this is where I'm gonna talk a lot about maximum advancement. 
only surgical option which is shown to be as effective as CPAP, only surgical option. And we're gonna show through some of the soft tissue stuff. But then, you know, weight loss is very critical for them. We found that it will be very effective. Uh, then the, the medical one is, you know, sleep habits, sleep hygiene. Have you ever heard of personal sleep hygiene? Okay. Well, so sleep hygiene is basically going to sleep consistently around a certain time frame and wake up at a certain time frame. So that means you have a tendency, you'll fall asleep a lot better in those situations. If you vary it dramatically, then we won't be falling asleep, or you'll be too tired in the morning, or you're not asleep in the night at all. So if you make it a habit, that makes a difference. Another thing, uh, you know, you have a bunch of coffees, you know, Red Bulls and stuff, you're not gonna fall asleep, let's be honest on those things. So, so that's the thing there. So you don't wanna sleep, drink those things at least an hour and a half, two hours before. So again, these things which interrupt sleep patterns. So that's one of the things we teach them about that. You, again, you're gonna hear a lot more about this. We're gonna talk, okay, you're gonna hear most likely about the next lecture. Uh, behavior management, we're talking about all these things. And, uh, okay, this is what you're talking about CPAP, guys. I mean, you wear this, you gotta carry this little motor around no matter where you go. I mean, imagine going on a vacation, you're carrying this, you, you feel like you have a factor running, and those guys who are, those women who are married, or guys who are married, imagine your spouse is right next to you. They don't want you to sleep in the same room. I don't want my wife to sleep in the same room, I'll be honest with you. I want her to sleep in another room. So that's like a running motor right next to you. So that's the problem here, guys, and you would be surprised. It's very, very, very common. People with vast sleep apnea, they will almost never sleep with their spouse in the same room. You'd be surprised because number one, the sleeping, the snoring keeps them awake, number one. Number two, if after not snoring, that water is keeping you awake. Both of the things keep me awake. So it means that both of them are not sleeping anymore. So that's a problem there. So not surprising. In fact, about half the time they found that the spouses are the ones who are saying their husband should or wife should get the sleep. Study. Most often it's the husband that is more prevalent than the guys tells them to go and get the sleep study. So it's one of the driving factors. So poor compliance, and as I said, we are not. So Dell appliances, you're gonna hear a lot more about next year. And this is where uh, the new recommendations are that if somebody is diagnosed with sleep apnea, you give them a choice of CPAP, or if they don't think they're gonna use it, you recommend dental appliances. All it does is, all these appliances is two things. 90% or 80 to 90% of them help you position the mandible forward keeps it forward, okay? So that means the tongue doesn't fall back. That's all it does. So you can titrate it based on that. Or some of them hold the tongue forward. That's what it does, so all the devices. And you're gonna hear a lot more next week about these things. And these are different devices. This, I think, there are about 60 of them in the market, but two or three of them are very popular. And one of them is actually came out of uh, the Steve Bender, you will see and his, his, his mentor or partner developed one of those things. So. So the, this used to be what we used to follow. We said, okay, you know, if these things fail, we should think of a surgery, and the surgery would be first phase is soft tissue stuff, the second phase is skeleton, so the soft tissue fail. Well, this is completely thrown off, okay? Stanford came up with all studies of sleep apnea initially, but now this is not anymore. We know right away, we skip all this garbage and get right to the actual part of it if they have a severe sleep apnea. If they have minimal moderate sleep apnea, or if their primary concern is snoring, then we would think of these things. And I'll show you what each one involves. Okay, again, phase one procedures involve soft palate, that is all the surgeries in the nose, all the surgeries in the tongue area, okay? That's what we're doing, okay? That's phase one. Anything with the soft tissue within that frame. That is the soft palate, the nose, the septum, the turbinates, and then the tongue itself, that's what we're looking at. Phase two involves everything with the bone. Phase one is all this in phase, soft tissue phase two is with the bones. Now remember, I want to emphasize, this is just an example of what we do, this is a deviated septum, we can see that, and we do what's called a dorsal approach. You can appreciate this deviation right here, this is not much of an airflow compared to this side. And what we did is we straightened the septum here, and we did what we call it a spread of grass. Have you guys used breathe right strips? Okay, have you ever wondered what happens to breathe right strips? It just increases the angle right here, okay, by a few degrees. And that's what this is doing, it's called spread of grass. It increases by about four degrees, and you're increasing in, in airflow efficiency by 70%. That's what happens. So that's exactly what breathe right strips are. Not surgically, but here we're doing surgically. So that's one thing, okay, that's the nasal surgery. So, okay, most often that's a septal surgery. Then the pharynx, okay, the oral and the pharynx, pharyngeal area. Tons like me, I'm sure at least some of you as kids, you might have got it done. And then you're gonna look at your triple P, and that is uvular palatal pharyngoplasty, that is 
lobula, palate, pharynx, all of them are plastic reshaped, that's what happens. And that can be done by a laser or, or ultrasonic scalpel, it doesn't matter. They're just modalities of uh, minimizing pain, that's all it is, because it's a super painful surgery. You might have heard about it. If you're gonna get tonsil surgery, it's an absolutely miserable surgery. And that is correct, guys, absolutely miserable surgery. And, and uh, uh, we, I, especially as an adult, it's even miserable. I mean, we get this, I get this quite a bit at uh, one of the hospitals I work at. And they're from large infections in the tonsils. And we take, I'm taking them out at, at the time of infection, which is even, uh, uh, we think it's the best way to do it. In fact, that's what the data says that, but still it's very painful. So here's what it describes. I'm not even gonna go through all these things. We don't care who these guys are. You don't need to know any of that. You just need to know what the procedure is, that's all, okay? So what we're doing is, take this here. This is a soft palate here. The uvula, typically it's pretty long in these patients. Uh, and, and then along the soft palate. We're trimming these edges, trimming these edges. We're taking the tonsils out and we're gonna bring this edge to this edge. So basically, anything which is collapsed like this is held out like that. That's what is happening. Anything which is collapsed like this, held out laterally. Okay, that's what it does. And then you make the soft palate a little bit. Works wonderfully for snoring. I mean, it's the single best thing you can do for snoring. Doesn't solve sleep apnea, but it works well for snoring. So another important thing, snoring itself doesn't mean they have sleep apnea. All of us snore at some point. If snoring means you have obstruction, that's all it means. There's a turbulence created by airflow across the soft palate. But in sleep apnea patients, that uh, you can have snoring a lot. So a severe sleep apnea patient may not have any snoring. They can have a complete obstruction. There's no air moving at all in that situation, okay? So generally snoring itself doesn't mean you have sleep apnea. So this is an example here. I gave another similar, similar picture, and this is how it's gonna look. That's another way of doing it. And uh, let me go through some clinically here. And here's what we're talking, huge tonsils, huge tonsils. They trimmed off the soft palate, you can see that and then we can get these edges together. And you can see this is, the patient had a breathing tube, you can't see anything there, but here you can see that. As I said, it's just the different modalities. We can use a laser or ultrasonic scalpel, and if they're available in the hospital, most often I use them, but otherwise, you know, you can do with a, with a blade, it bleeds like crazy, so uh, I would rather do it with a cardio or a, or a laser or ultrasonic scalpel. And another example here. So this is what happens, you can see how, the, it's the same angle, same view, guys. You can't see the breathing tube. This is a breathing tube which is going from inside the nose to the back of the throat. Okay, this is a patient is asleep, obviously. And you can see how it opens up the airway in this group of patients. Here's the problem. If you have a tongue-based obstruction, it doesn't work well, okay? Tongue-based obstruction happens in all the patients who are severe sleep apnea. So that means it works in a very, very, very small percentage of people. So that's why we used to think, try this first. If it doesn't work, then go for the other surgeries. Well, you know what, now that has changed. The paradigm has shifted. We don't, we skip all these things. In fact, we think sometimes if you're not careful, you might even narrow the airway. So we don't do this that much. Then some people came up and said, you know what, if I want to do this, I'm going to int introduce this little sclerosing, soft tissue sclerosing stuff. We call it the pillars. You just put it in the tissue and it just starts down and elevates things up, okay? And I'm showing you a, uh, just a picture like this. That means I've never done this and I don't care about doing this because the success rate is very, very, very low. And there's no point in doing this. It's a great, great marketing given. You can say, I'm gonna stop snoring, but you know what, I'm not treating sleep apnea. That's what you're not doing, okay? But it works great for if you just wanna deal with snoring. No long-term studies have been shown, that's the problem. Uh, we used to do this once upon a time. We used to take off this tongue, we take off this, all this tongue, and you, know, you can see that that's seven centimeters of tongue, just bunch of meats basically taken off and put on the side and then suture these tongue together. So you took the body, the bulk, the muscular part of it, that way it decreases the size of the tongue so that way you can do that. Uh, found out it doesn't do too well. Again, the tongue kind of expands again, not too good. Again, just not. But now, the heart tissue procedures dominate everything in the surgery. This is what has shown the most successful. So when we talked about U2P and you combine with genioglossal advancement, the success rate dramatically increases. What we're doing is when we move the chin forward, you're moving the genioglossal muscle forward. You know where the genioglossal muscle is attached, right? Pushed it to the mandible. You guys know that, correct? Okay, if not, you should look into the anatomy there. Because things we don't typically. So what we do is, we decide to do a classic chin, we just move the chin forward, or 
we decide to just move this part to make a square where the muscle is attached to that, move it forward and then rotate it. So that means the muscle stays forward and the tongue stays forward. When they're sleeping, the tongue always stays forward. So the obstruction is relieved. It's doing exactly what a mandibular positioning device is doing. Instead of going the mandible forward, it's only putting the muscle forward. That's what, that means the tongue itself is forward. So when you keep the mandible forward, what you're ultimately doing is the, is the tongue staying forward. That's what you're doing. Okay. So the problem is anytime you do these things, you know, intraorally you take these incisions and you know these other teeth, obviously you can see all the way to the inferior part of the mandible. And you just, this is a big step. That's about a centimeter chin you moved forward. And this one also you moved about more than a centimeter in fact in these things because you shave off the outer cortex, that's what happens. So it works very well. Uh, in this patient, if I don't want to change the patient's facial profile, I would do that. This one, if I want to change the facial profile, that means I want to give a stronger chin, I would do this way. If I don't want to change that, we will do this way. So here's the thing, we're gonna go, so just to give an example, came to us for sleep apnea, why can't we advance the mandible in these patients? I just move the chin forward by that, that's all we did for her. Why can't we advance the mandible forward? Well, it's dictated by the teeth, right? I can't give him malocclusion. Well, the guy, the patient has a certain occlusion with dental compensations, and I just can't put things wherever I want. So the teeth dictate where it needs to be. So in this one, we did a pretty aggressive chin. That's what it did. I probably moved this chin about, about a centimeter and a half or so, and we grafted that area there. And she came to us for sleep apnea, but at the same time, she didn't want to go for optometric surgery and the jaw surgery. So because of the teeth position, we just had to just go ahead and do only advanced chin. Um, and there's another example. On the table, patient asleep, you can see it's almost no chin from the chin to the neck. There's no chin rectangle here. Again, sleep apnea patient. And this is post-operatively, immediately on the operating room table, advancing the chin forward. I think it's about another centimeter and a half or so. You can see the difference in the definition when you move the chin forward. So what it's doing is, it's keeping the tongue and the tongue base and the muscles forward. That's what we're doing in this one here. So this is giving all the tongue base and the hypoglossal, that is below the tongue base, everything forward in this position. So here's a great example. Soft palate, this is an, uh, pretty enlarged. The airway, not too bad, but it's not that great. And just to show you that we did a U triple P, that means the soft palate length is decreased, and then we advance the chin forward. So basically you're getting a cosmetic result, but that's not the primary purpose or intention. You're opening up the airway for these patients. And that's what we're doing. So remember, what it does is when we do these things, it keeps things stretched, not just forward, but when you put things under tension, even laterally it's not collapsing. That's what is happening in this patient. It's called genioglossal advancement. Well, now this is the gold standard. It's called telegnathic surgery or maxillar mandibular advancement. Okay, <coughs> telegnathic. That means we are moving the jaws forward as a telescope. That's what we're doing. Or maxillar mandibular advancement. We're moving the maxilla and the mandible, everything forward. In this one, along with the chin also. So preferably a centimeter or so. We want to move it forward. That's when it's shown to be effective. What happens when you do that? When you move this forward, when you move this forward, all of a sudden the soft palate is forward. The nasal air, uh, airway is opened up more, the tongue base is opened up, and the tongue stays forward. Everything stays forward. Why, are we gonna, are people gonna look terrible? That's the question, right? Well, here's the beauty, guys. Everybody benefits from this after you're 40. So, uh, so that's what it does. And I'll tell you, uh, the, the, really the advancement is dictated by cosmetics and physiologic limits of how much I can move forward, okay? So we used to call it phase two now, but again, it's become a phase one itself if there are severe sleep apnea patients, and if they've failed CPAP treatment, or if they've failed the dental appliances, so that's the important thing. So this is probably taking the main stage, and the only one which has shown to have as effective. Uh, this picture is bad, but you move the maxilla forward, this is the nasal floor, nasal floor again, and you do the same thing in the mandible, you can see the man is <coughs> forward, it's about a centimeter. This is just to show you intraoperatively. And again, for sleep apnea, we don't have braces and stuff. We're doing arch bars and do that. But the success rate ranges from 90 to 100% based on how we define success. If you have a complete resolution, it's 80%. If you think you have a significant improvement, it's 95 to 98%. So that's what it's doing. And this is an example here. This man's maxilla, mandible, and the chin are moved by a centimeter. Not for cosmetics. Not for anything else. <coughs> yes. What kind of recovery? So. Yeah. So very important question. Uh, it, six weeks is what we tell them. 
Uh, but I will tell you that um, it depends on comorbid situations. What kind of uh, comorbidities do they have? If they have very high poor blood pressure, very high risk for surgery. And remember, the severe sleep apnea patients are high risk for surgery to start off with. They all need to be in the ICU for at least for a few days, and then those are the things. So, uh, so if this was done, orthognathic surgery, in, a, in, a, in which we would encounter a lot in orthodontics, that we tell them six weeks is still the recovery. That's how long the bone takes to heal, the primary healing. However, it's about 10 days or so, it's real downtime. Because after that, we want them moving around and eating soft food up to six, up to six weeks. After six weeks, they should be back to normal and eating regular food. But these patients, that first phase is what increases. Instead of 10 days, it might be 15 days. But we expect them by six weeks to be completely normal. That means we want them eating and drinking and all those things. And you will see they have a lot of cardiac complications. So that's why we keep them in the ICU. So these patients have previous uh, episodes of heart attacks, previous episodes of stroke. And so for us to control bleeding during the surgery in a, in a younger patient, not a big deal. We drop the blood pressures to like nine, eight, 70 over 40. Okay, we tell them in the operating room, I wanted that low. But for these patients, when you do that, the oxygen doesn't perfuse.